Hey folks, and welcome back to the video lectures for Philosophy 120, Critical Thinking, where we dig into our seventh and final unit of the semester, where we will be talking about arguments by analogy and nothing else. This is actually the final lecture of the entire semester, with the exception of the live streamed review, which isn't really a lecture. Uh, and so this is it. There is no looking forward. There is no other chapter. There is no long assignment or dry work hiding at the end of this thing. This is our final subject, and it's less a heavy chapter with a whole lot of vocab and lessons to be learned and problems to do than it is just a brief look at another useful tool to include in our critical thinking toolkits. So overall, uh, you survived. You made it. This is it. It's December, it's almost finals week, and you're just about through. So, you know, congrats on surviving this far, guys. Uh, so that we don't take up too much of your time, I know you've got a lot of stuff to look at and plenty of things to consider over the next couple of weeks. So let's go ahead and start talking about analogies, shall we? We'll follow our usual format for today. Like I said, it's a little bit lighter uh, the concepts are not super difficult, and the vocabulary is not particularly complicated. In fact, there's not much at all vocab-wise to worry about. Uh, but we'll start off with a basic overview of the concepts. We'll run through what makes arguments by analogy work, and then we'll take spend a little bit of time looking at how to evaluate analogies and what makes a good one versus a bad one, which is always something that we need to be aware of when we're dealing with any sort of argument. It's kind of like the whole point of critical thinking, you might say. Uh, but first, uh, if you've been following the unit checklists, like I suggest that you do, you've probably already taken a look at the Monty Python video that uh, was posted, a nice little three and a half minute scene, that if you have anything resembling a living sense of humor, you probably found hilarious. If not, you've either already seen it before and it's lost all of its uh, magic, so to speak, or you just don't have a sense of humor that matches well with British stuff. That's all right. But uh, I will be referring to the argument a couple of times throughout all this. It serves as a nice example of perhaps truly insane logic, but logic nonetheless, where in the scene, uh, essentially a group of idiot medieval peasants in a comedic, over-exaggerated world uh, find a woman and bring her to the local noble, insisting that they've found a witch, and to prove that she's a witch, they will check and see if she weighs the same as a duck. Because if she weighs the same as a duck, then she must be made out of wood, and therefore a witch. Which, I have to admit, is an absolutely insane inference to make. Uh, there seems to be very little justification for this sort of thing, and I'm not going to kill the joke by overanalyzing it or over explaining it. But what I do want to do is look and see why on God's earth does this absolutely insane sentence in the context of the scene actually make a small amount of sense? How is there any sort of semi-logical structure to this bit of nonsense that's being done at a British sketch comedy movie? That's really nothing more than a giant British Saturday Night Live sketch drawn far, far out of proportion. Hilariously, but still. So I think the thing that makes this work, you know, this is not officially in the textbook materials or anything else, but I think what makes the Monty Python work, Monty Python argument work, is that it's actually a multi-step argument by analogy. That is, it uses a particular kind of argument that draws conclusions based on the similarities between one thing and another. So an analogy is literally just compar comparing and drawing a comparison between two different things to show how they're similar. You, know, you might have seen formal analogies in the sense of uh, a dog is to mammal as lizard is to reptile, where they're showing how two different relationships are similar or something like that. 
technically an analogy is broader than that. Analogies are literally just drawing comparisons between two things to show how they're similar. And in this case, you can actually build arguments around them that then use that similarity or that supposed similarity to draw conclusions about one thing or another. And they often use a more well-known subject or well-known thing to tell us something about a less known or at least less clear or less understood subject. And we can refer to the two different parts of an analogy as the primary subject and the analog. The primary subject is the thing that the analogy or the arguments really focused on, the thing that the argument's actually about. So like in the case of the Monty Python argument that we'll, again, use a couple of different times, the argument's really about witches uh, and saying what thing, what are some of the properties of witches? And namely that they apparently weigh the same as a duck and are made out of wood, which again, insane, but we'll get there. So the primary subject is the thing that the analogy or the argument by analogy is about. The thing that you compare that subject to we'll refer to as the analog. It's literally just there for comparison and illustration purposes. It's the thing that's usually better understood of the two because we can, we can take the unknown subject and look over to the known area and use things that we know about it to highlight those similar or uh, the set or identical features in the original subject. And they generally follow the same sort of pattern overall, arguments by analogy. Uh, they generally work by saying something like this. The, anal the analog, excuse me, analog is so-and-so. You know, it's got such and such a property. It's got such and such a feature. Such and such is true about it. So the analog is some certain way. And then oftentimes in arguments by analogy, this is a hidden premise. But usually there is the premise that the subject, the thing the argument is actually about, is relevantly similar in some way. That is, it also is so-and-so, and therefore it has the same sort of property. And when I lay out the structure of these in this way and use the phrase relevantly similar, I'm not just using a particularly pretentious or like old or traditional turn of phrase here. This isn't just something that philosophers do. The relevantly similar part is basically the core of the entire idea of an argument by analogy. You see, analogies only work when the subject and the analog are similar in relevant ways to the conclusion. That is, you can make an analogy between any two things you like. You could draw an analogy between recording video lectures and square dancing if you wanted to. I don't know why you would, but you could. Uh, or you could compare uh, coffee and joining the Mile High Club. Again, not sure why you could, why you would, but you can draw comparisons between those all day long if you want. But arguments by analogy work when the subject and the analog are similar in ways that are relevant to the conclusion that's trying to be proved. Remember, analogies are just the comparisons. It's not either of the two objects. It's not the argument. The analogy is literally the comparison. The argument, however, is still trying to do the same thing that arguments always do. That is, they're trying to use a set of facts or claims or evidence to give rational support for a particular conclusion. In this case, the evidence that the argument by analogy cites is the evidence of these two things are similar, and therefore we can say certain things about them. Now, analogies work when the subject and analog are similar in the right sorts of ways, in ways that are actually relevant to the conclusion that's going on. And these arguments by analogy fail when the two things are not similar in relevant ways. By relevant, we mean has some sort of a connection to the conclusion, just like we've been talking about way back when, when we looked at the relevancy, there are conditions for cogent arguments. Uh, to sort of illustrate like bad analogies or bad comparisons, Take an intentional bit of nonsense out of Alice in Wonderland, Lewis Carroll's famous book, where there's the sort of puzzle that gets thrown around a couple of times of why is a raven like a writing desk? 
And various fans of Alice in Wonderland have come up with different answers to this sort of thing. Yeah, and they're all convoluted and odd. My favorite of them is that Poe wrote on both, which is just somewhat of a pun more than anything. But Lewis Carroll intentionally chose a raven and a writing desk because they're nothing alike at all. It's like, oh, I'm about to make an analogy to help illustrate how dissimilar these two things are. Uh, they're an intentionally an odd match. They aren't relevant to each other in hardly any way that's ever relevant to the story or the discussions that happen between characters. It's just treated as an odd sort of riddle, an intentional bit of nonsense. So analogies work when the two things being compared are relevantly similar. If they're not, the, if they're not similar in the right sorts of ways, the analogy honestly is a pretty useless one for the argument that's trying to be proven or demonstrated. If we look at the witch argument from Monty Python again, we can actually see some of the sorts of things that make it work. Like I said, this is an absolute bit of nonsense out of the movie. It's it, it, total insanity. But there is this odd sort of structure to it that you can follow. It's why the whole bit works. It's these people trying to think logically about an illogical subject, something that doesn't make any sense. And they're doing it ridiculously, but there is still some kind of twisted reasoning behind it, some kind of a structure there in the argument that makes it almost work. And what works here, the thing that makes this a good illustration of an argument by analogy, is that there's a couple of different similarities that get picked on to try and prove the overall conclusion. So like the whole scene starts off with the idea that they've found a witch, and they want to try and prove that she's a witch. And they need to figure out how they can prove she's a witch. So they start off by assuming that she's a witch. And what do they know about witches? Witches burn. So at this point, then, they ask, or uh, the knight asks, what else burns? Well, wood also burns. And so uh, they end up drawing the conclusion, witches are like wood. You know, they both burn, which on its own, this right here, those first four statements I've written out here are an argument by analogy. You say the idea that witches burn, wood burns. In other words, you say that wood is relevantly similar to witches. And then based on that, based on the, just those two statements, lines two and three, you can conclude that witches are like wood. They are the same in a certain sort of way. Both of them burn. And then from here, the scene just keeps going. Wood floats on water. Ducks float on water. Therefore, wood must be like a duck. Or ducks are like wood in some sense. And then from here, from this you know, sub-conclusion, they end up drawing the conclusion that witches are like ducks. You know, there's this relationship going from witch to wood to duck. And thus they kind of jump witch to ducks. And therefore, because witches are like ducks, that is because witches are relevantly similar to ducks and ducks float, we should expect witches to float. And why do they float? Well, it's because they weigh a certain amount, which again is ludicrous and not how science and density works. I know that a few of you who are STEM Students are probably like having a minor aneurysm at the idea that it's because of weight rather than density or specific gravity of water or whatever else. But here at the moment, in the absurd little world of Monty Python, uh, the whole basic argument goes, ducks float on water, witches are like ducks, they're relevantly similar, thus witches should also float on water. You have a comparison between two things, between the subject, witches, and the analog, ducks. And because they are similar in a relevant way, we can draw conclusions about the subject based on the analog. So why worry about any of this? Why are we using the example? Why are we talking about arguments by analogy? Why are we wasting our time with vocab like 
primary subject and analog and so on. It seems like an awfully convoluted thing for a very intuitive piece of reasoning. I'm sure that a few of you at least are thinking. And that's a little bit fair. Uh, a lot of what we talk about in here is fairly intuitive and obvious reasoning. You've been through uh, 11 chapters at this point, almost the entire textbook since we started in August. And you've seen a lot of reasoning that probably in retrospect looks entirely obvious. But the point of critical thinking is, is to understand why this reasoning works so that we can more accurately apply the tools of that reasoning so that we can have terms and ideas and concepts about how this thinking works so that we can use it more effectively in our day-to-day -day lives and out in the real world. So the same thing is true with arguments by analogy. Overall, they're fairly straightforward. It's the sort of thing that we do every day. As soon as I start drawing an example to something in real life, I'm effectively doing an implied argument by analogy. Uh, even right now, in order to explain why we're doing this sort of thing or how this sort of thing is useful, I'm drawing a comparison to something else that I do that we can take as being useful. And because it's similar to that situation, we can conclude that this also is a useful thing. So this pattern of thinking, this argument on the basis of these two things being related in a certain way, is a really, really ordinary, everyday workhorse kind of thinking. But looking at the details of it is a useful thing to be familiar with. For one, arguments by analogy don't fit obviously into some of the other systems of logic we've studied and looked at this semester. Uh, in particular, they can work in almost any sort of system of logic. Categorical is a little too formal, a little too limited. But propositional logic, this stuff fits right in. And there are inductive versions of these arguments that we'll mention just in a moment. So arguments by analogy, they do fit into other systems, but they require an assumption that we've not talked about or uh, dealt with so far. And the more familiar we get with that assumption and the skeleton of these kinds of arguments, the better we'll understand them and the more effectively we'll be able to use them. And they are an incredibly useful thing to be able to use. Uh, besides the fact that we use arguments by analogy every day in our ordinary thinking and engagement with the world and you know, decision-making processes and everything else, arguments by analogy are useful because they can help clarify conceptual issues. They can help us better to, to define things, to understand new and unknown subjects. Uh, even if you are an engineer who does very little actual like philosophical thinking, so to speak, not meant to be an insult, just a fact that you know, a lot of people in engineering or in business or in agriculture, uh, y'all probably don't do a whole lot of philosophical thinking very often. But that doesn't mean that you don't need to analyze and understand new concepts. This is an almost universal thing between people. And when we get new concepts, being able to relate those concepts to other things that we know and understand and then draw conclusions based on that is incredibly useful. It's like how we learn things, if you know, to be a little bit snide about it. Uh, two, as far as conceptual issues go, arguments by analogy help us nail down vague and ambiguous concepts. Uh, like if we want to work with a sort of nebulous concept, something that's ambiguous in the sense it's got multiple senses or it's not necessarily clear which of the multiple meanings is being used in this moment. Uh, like, take something like irresponsible. Say we have a friend that we need to decide, is he being irresponsible with his life right now? Because he's living in a certain way and we care for him and we really don't want to just throw his life away and become a garbage human being. So for one, we need to understand What's it mean for him to be irresponsible? Because irresponsible is a really fuzzy sort of concept. It can mean a lot of different things. Uh, you can be irresponsible when you turn a paper in a day late. And you can be irresponsible when you spend all of your rent money on booze. These two things are at far different ends of a spectrum, but they're related. And so you can take the concept of being irresponsible and 
and you can relate it to other things that are more concrete. We could say that, well, our friend is being irresponsible in a certain way because he's doing this like this other dude does in this situation. By drawing analogies to things that are better understood, things that are more concrete, that are a little more nailed down, we can start to better define and clarify the concept of irresponsibility. And then based on that, we can actually make a real judgment about whether or not we should intervene in our friend's life, whether we need to give them a come to Jesus talk or to just lay down, look, dude, you're doing something wrong here, or whether we know to back off. So arguments by analogy and understanding exactly how they work, being intentional about them, makes this tool far more available for us to use in everyday life than it would be otherwise. So even though it may be an over-analyzation of an everyday sort of thinking, like everything in this class has been, the more intentional we are with our understanding of this stuff, and the more explicit that we can make our understanding of how these things work, the better we'll be able to employ them, because we'll know every nook and cranny of how these systems work. Uh, another thing that's very useful about arguments from analogy, another reason why we should worry about this sort of thing, why it's worth identifying the vocab from before, is that arguments by analogy can actually help uh, refute other arguments in some cases. Uh, and it works something like a reductio ad absurdum argument, where essentially uh, when dealing with an argument and testing out whether it's worth believing or not, is this a good argument or not, or if we want to reject an argument that we know is a bad one, that we need to help show that it's a terrible argument, we can draw an analogy between the argument being presented and some other terrible argument, and then using that similarity like, hey, look, these follow the same uh, reasoning. They've got the same structure. We can help show that this is a terrible argument in the first place. The similarities help give evidence that the argument we're dealing with, the subject, is a terrible, terrible thing. Take, for example, uh, from a couple of lectures back, where we talked about uh, slippery slope fallacies. And I think I made the crack about milk being a gateway drug. That's an example of using argument by analogy to help refute a bad argument. Uh, you know, for those of you who don't remember, who have slept since then, or maybe you skipped that bit, uh, it's a common argument, it's less common these days, but overall, a common argument about drugs, particularly about marijuana being dangerous, is the idea that marijuana is a so-called gateway drug, that uh, a large majority of users of so-called hard drugs, like heroin, uh, first started smoking marijuana. And so this sort of argument is used as a slippery slope argument. The idea that people who smoke weed are on a slippery slope that's going to lead to doing hard drugs like heroin or uh, smoking crack or whatever else. Now, this is a terrible, terrible argument, for one, because it's a, it's a slippery slope fallacy. It's named for a reason. There's no inevitable slide from one thing to another in this case, uh, merely a possible one. And so it ain't necessarily so, we might say. But to help illustrate that, to show why a slippery slope argument is a terrible one, or why the gateway drug argument is a terrible argument, is we take the same structure of reasoning and we find a similar argument out in the world. And in this case, we make a ridiculous one. Say, well, you know, sure, 60% of people who use heroin first smoked marijuana. But 95% of people who uh, do heroin first drink milk. So I guess that makes milk the gateway drug to heroin. And that's obviously ridiculous. It doesn't take a whole lot to see. That's just dumb. There's no reason why you should treat milk as a gateway drug that's going to inevitably make all the people who drink it eventually turn to hard drugs and become junkies and whatever else. And because that's obviously bad, and because it's similar to the marijuana as a gateway drug argument, that similarity gives us reason, it gives us evidence for rejecting the argument in the first place. It helps demonstrate and show and refute 
that original argument. It essentially helps show the structural flaws in an argument. By ignoring the content and merely finding an ar a you know, bad argument out there in the world that has the same sort of structure to it and showing, hey, look, these two follow the same pattern, we can show that it's not necessarily that the other person's got their facts wrong or that they've got something interesting going on or maybe they just made a small mistake. No, it's showing that the reasoning itself is not something we can rely on. It's showing that this is an invalid argument, that it's something that, we, that won't guarantee that we have a true conclusion at the end of the day. Or it doesn't show that there's a strong link between this evidence and that conclusion. It highlights the bones of the argument. And oddly enough, you can even turn the same sort of strategy against other arguments by analogy, something called giving a counter analogy. If uh, I were, say, to offer the milk is a gateway drug argument, you could draw a different analogy that offers the opposite sort of conclusion where you uh, do the same sort of thing, but in reverse, you essentially take an argument by analogy and you say, take the subject. Uh, the gateway drug one actually is not the best example for this because I'm blanking on how to turn it into an opposite conclusion. But the one out of our textbook has to do with uh, proving the existence of God which is admittedly a touchy subject, but bear with me for a second. Uh, in philosophy, there is a argument sometimes called the teleological argument, or the, uh, the sometimes in debates or discussions called the clockmaker argument. And it's the idea that the universe is like a finely tuned watch or a finely tuned clock. There's a lot of intricate pieces. They're related by regular, well-organized laws and so this implies that there is an external outside maker because watches don't just appear randomly in the universe. Somebody has to intentionally make them. So because the universe is like a clock, we can conclude that the universe, like a clock, must have had a maker. It's called the teleological argument because it looks to uh, the purpose and the direction and the structure of the universe to help show that somebody designed it towards the purpose or toward with the goal in mind of having this well-ordered structured universe. Anyway, what Hume does to offer a counter analogy is Hume draws an analogy between the universe and an animal. Like an animal, the universe has many component parts that are organized in a certain way that are interrelated in certain ways and requires a, soul or a vital force inside of it to help make everything flow and fit together. And so we might say that the universe is like an animal and thus must have something like a soul within it that helps unify and direct all the different components, the organ systems and whatever else. Now on its own, that just sounds like, well, sounds like Hume gave another argument for the existence of God. But in point of fact, Hume's analogy and the clockmaker analogy give opposite sorts of conclusions. Yes, they both argue for some version of God, but one of them argues for a God that is outside the universe. In fact, that's the whole point of the clockmaker analogy, that there has to be something that is outside the universe that created it in the first place. Whereas the animal analogy says that there has to be some sort of thing inside the universe. There has to be some kind of a soul or a force or something inside that makes everything work. These are opposite and mutually exclusive conclusions. So by giving an alternate analogy that is just as good or better, you can show that the original comparison isn't actually all that meaningful. Just because you can draw a comparison between one thing and another doesn't mean that it's actually all that informative. The facts that you may have pulled out of that comparison may just be speculation. It may not be anything that's actually there at all. So not only can you use arguments from analogy to disprove ordinary arguments, you can use them to, dis to disprove each other. They're very useful tools to have when it comes to uh, responding to and dealing with uh, arguments of all sorts. Now, 
besides just throwing analogies around everywhere, we can also just evaluate uh, arguments from analogy in a few different ways. For one, uh, analogies come in two different types, just like ordinary arguments. Uh, they come in both a priori and a posteriori flavors. And for those of you who remember, I think it's from chapter five, something is a priori if it's not based on sense experience. That is, if you could understand it through reason alone or if you could deal with it through reason alone. You don't have to experience it with your senses or anybody else's senses. Uh, something is a posteriori if it does require empirical evidence going out into the world and seeing something with one of your five senses. Now, when it comes to analogies, a priori analogies are ones that could be about either hypothetical or actual similarities and situations. So like uh, when I deal with, oh, what would be a simple one? Well, take the pig and the soul, or the animal and the soul sort of thing uh, from Hume's discussion of the, of the counter analogy just a moment ago. Uh, Hume's counter analogy is one that talks about animals, organs, and souls, and how they require souls to fit together and for everything to work in unison and all that. This is not something that's verified through empirical, you know, physical evidence or anything that can be observed directly through the five senses of anybody. It's a purely hypothetical thing that we're drawing the comparison to. There is no empirical fact of the matter that animals have souls. They might, but this is not something that's empirically proven because almost by definition, the concept of a soul is non-material. So it's not the sort of thing that you can prove with material evidence. Uh, instead, it's a purely hypothetical comparison being made. However, an a posteriori analogy is one that draws comparisons to something based on actual factual similarities. That is, it's based on actual uh, cases and evidence and examples. So rather than saying that Oh, I'm, honestly, this is the one type of comparison I'm not great with just pulling off the top of my head simply because I end up second-guessing myself far too much. Um, but say if you were extrapolating on your past experience, say you've got a favorite coffee shop or something like that, and so uh, you find out that they've opened a second location somewhere else in town, and so you think about it and you want to say, well... I wonder if they're any good. And so you're reasoning to yourself. Well, the last six times I went to the first location, it was all really good. And because this other location must be similar to the first one, it's also probably really good. Here, if you notice, we're using inductive reasoning. We're talking about it's probably good like the other one. And it's based on actual empirical evidence that was observed out in the world. Whereas if we had drawn a hypothetical uh, comparison, well, this new location's a lot like uh, really good coffee shops. Things that could be either real or hypothetical doesn't really matter. Instead, we're dealing more with the concept, the idea of the whole thing than we are actual things that happened in the world in the last six months or something like that. So analogies can come in a couple of different sorts, a priori, a posteriori. Uh, a priori analogies are, could be about either actual things or hypothetical, doesn't really matter. A posteriori analogies are based on actual real things that happened or existed. Now, why do we care about the categories? Well, the kind of analogy that's being drawn determines a little bit how we evaluate it, how we rate it, how we determine whether it's good or bad. A priori analogies, ones that are based on uh, actual or hypothetical similarities, these we evaluate in the same way that we evaluate arguments. That is, we use ARG conditions. So we ask ourselves, you know, if we're wanting to evaluate an a priori analogy, we ask ourselves, are there any relevant differences that make the similarity being discussed unacceptable? 
like say if I'm uh, evaluating that coffee shop and saying, do I, th- I wonder if it's any good. And I say, well, it's like uh, other good coffee shops. Here, the comparison is between this real new coffee shop and the concept of other good coffee shops. And I might say, well, other good coffee shops have high quality coffee. They've got good staff, whatever else. I start listing off the features of good coffee shops, which is a purely hypothetical thing. It's a concept. It's not a real thing out in the world. Here, I might start to ask, well, are there any relevant differences that make the comparison unacceptable? Well, maybe this new coffee shop doesn't actually roast their own coffee or anything like that. Maybe they uh, don't actually get good beans from anywhere. That's a relevant difference, a difference that actually matters to the conclusion that we can't just ignore or gloss over. And so there might be some reason to reject the whole similarity based on A conditions, based on acceptability. We might also ask, are the similarities being evaluated actually relevant to the conclusion? Uh, Suppose I start comparing the new coffee shop and the old coffee shop and say these two things are similar. And I start talking about how, well, the shingles are the same color, so it's got to be good. Well, that's stupid. The color of the shingles on the roof do not affect the quality of the coffee inside. If they do, it is a barista secret that I have never discovered in any of my home brewing at at home. So just because there are similarities doesn't mean the similarities are necessarily relevant to the conclusion. So this is another ground that we can use to accept or reject a a priori analogy. And We might also ask, do these similarities give sufficient grounds to believe the conclusion? And this works just like it does for ordinary arguments. Is there enough evidence here for me to rationally believe the conclusion? Is there enough evidence that actually warrants accepting this idea? Now, a posteriori analogies are a little bit different. These are based on real factual cases The analog can't be hypothetical, and in this case, we have to compare real, actual facts between the two things. So since we're not dealing with concepts, since we're not dealing with uh, things that are ideal or things that are just purely hypothetical, we have to look at the actual observed facts and features of the world. And the more similar that these facts the facts about the two different things are the stronger the analogy, which sounds like a no duh sort of moment. But oftentimes with a posteriori analogies, this means that you have to have a certain amount of background knowledge in order to actually evaluate the comparison. Because say if we're, um, suppose we're trying to identify new features about a previously undiscovered animal in Africa. And it looks like a little tiny rhino that's colored pink for some reason. Like it's a small, adorable, pet store-sized rhino. And we want to figure out things about said rhino. So we can use arguments by analogy. We can start drawing comparisons between the micro rhino and the full-sized real deal thing. Well... In order to say that the two horns are actually similar, you know, that they've got such and such a curve, they're made of such and such a material, and that they have such and such DNA and proteins that make it up, that requires you to actually know certain things about real rhinos, about actual facts, about observed things that exist in the world. If you don't have that background knowledge, you can't make good comparisons. You can't evaluate those comparisons. So a posteriori analogies often require background knowledge about the subject matter being evaluated, whereas a priori ones, ones that rely just on the concept of the thing rather than uh, the actual thing out in the world, they don't require nearly so much of the background knowledge because they don't have to be real. Hypothetical is good enough for an a priori analogy.
And it's not that one of these is necessarily better than the other. They're simply useful for different situations, just like deductive and inductive arguments are different for different sorts of situations. Uh, but these are good things to be aware of. And then it's worth saying a word about faulty or sometimes called loose analogies. And simply put, bad analogies don't describe similarities. Oftentimes people will make arguments based on bad analogies and this ends up being a fallacy just like any of the others in that uh, the connections and similarities being drawn don't justify the conclusions being talked about. And uh, our book gives us a number of different examples of this sort of thing to help illustrate the concept. And it runs through a few other strategies for evaluating these things, things to look out for, things to spot. But overall, the core idea is that faulty analogies don't describe actual similarities. Uh, an analogy is bad if the two things are not similar in relevant ways. If there's no relevant similarity, bad analogy and bad evidence, which really is about the core of the concept. There's not a whole lot else to say on that one. So with the knowledge of how to evaluate these analogies, let's go back to the Monty Python argument and see exactly why it sort of works and really, really doesn't. So if we look at the argument, the whole thing is built of one giant argument by analogy, namely finally drawing the conclusion that uh, witches are like ducks, ducks float on water, and therefore witches should also float on water because they are similar to ducks. Now, here we might wonder, how in the world are witches like ducks? Well, the thing in the middle of the argument that makes witches like ducks, or that supposes that witches are like ducks, are that witches are like wood, and ducks are like woods. They're both similar to wood. Now, the fact that two different things are similar to wood, which is already a stretch, the fact that witches burn and that wood burns is a terrible reason to say that these two things are similar. Because if you get it hot enough, everything burns. So in that sense, everything is similar to wood. And so we should say that everything floats on water, which is obviously stupid. So this seems like a bad analogy from the start. Uh, these things are maybe similar in some ways, I guess witches and ducks, uh, they maybe both are sometimes cute, sometimes evil. Uh, they both have cartoons made about them. You know, we can make all sorts of comparisons and similarities between them, but they don't seem to be similar in relevant ways. Same thing with witches and wood. Witches and wood may have a number of similarities. The fact that they both burn is not a relevant similarity for saying that uh, witches should float on water. So at the end of the day, the comparison being made between witches and wood is not a relevant comparison. It's not one that helps support the conclusion in any way. It is a comparison. It is a similarity. It's just not a particularly useful one which is why the structure of this thing looks good. It's using a recognized logical form, namely argument by analogy, but it's doing so with bad comparisons. So it sort of has a twisted structure to it, but it's still ridiculous enough to make good comedy. So, you know, overall success for the movie, but maybe this is why the thing seems a little odd as far as holy cow, I can actually follow the reasoning here, even though it's stupid. Which I guess is really the whole point of using it as an example. It illustrates my point well for the lesson, and it helps us understand the joke a little bit better, maybe. And that's all I got, guys. Uh, I would normally say, so next time we'll start looking at so-and-so, but there is no next time. This is the last lecture, as I said at the start. So everything else in the unit, everything else that I could say next time or looking ahead and so on is just stuff that's meant to help you get ready for the final. Uh, everything else in the unit is meant to help you study or to help you get ready. 
That is the journal for this unit is uh, a, you know, again, like a lot of our journals, it's a somewhat like conceptual or almost philosophical uh, bit of thinking that's related to the subject. But the homework, rather than being uh, several pages of problems having to do with, is this a good analogy? Is this a bad analogy? And a whole lot of time and attention has been on things that you probably don't care about at the moment because you just want to get ready for the final and be done. Instead, your homework assignment is a review assignment. It pulls uh, one to two multi-step problems from the whole book, from each of the chapters that we've looked at. So if you do the homework, that should be a pretty solid review as far as practicing the different things and applying the different concepts that we've talked about. It's not super long, but it's detailed enough that it'll hit you hit the high points of each of the chapters, so it should help jog your memory. And to help save you on a bit of workload, it counts as your quiz as well. There is no extra quiz for this unit. Uh, I will grade the homework as if it were a homework. That is, you do it, you get effort and completion points, so long as you didn't half-ass it and just copy everything. And it'll count for enough points that it's as if you aced the quiz without trying. So, happy holidays. That's my little gift to you. Uh, don't forget to also uh, take a look at the review. I've posted the link on Blackboard, uh, so you should be able to follow it for the appointed time and take a look at when that whole thing is. I encourage you to watch it live so that you can ask your questions and have me answer them. Uh, if you don't have a chance to do so, uh, feel free to watch the review after the fact. It automatically records and you can follow the same link to the video. And if you have questions that don't get answered there, either because nobody shows up or your question just wasn't asked, please feel free to email me to set up a time in office hours. Uh, whatever I can do to help, I will gladly do so. Uh, yeah, as always, feel free to let me know with other questions. Check out the review, do the stuff, and congrats for making it far this, this far, guys. I know a lot of this is really tough material and you're spending more time learning how to think and how to think well than most people ever do. Just most people never take the time to do this sort of thing. So whether you chose it willingly or it was the best of a bad lot, I'm proud of how well you guys have done with it. I'm like seriously proud of how you guys have handled it, how you've learned and how you've incorporated some of these things, hopefully into your own work and your own lives. So until next time, guys, if there is a next time, happy thinking and good luck with the rest of your finals.